Our speaker this evening was ordained in 1996 when he finished his Master of Arts degree at the Angelicum in Rome. He has served as parochial vicar at several parishes in the Diocese of Arlington and as pastor of St. John the Beloved in McLean. He currently serves as the Episcopal Vicar for Clergy, Director of the Permanent Diaconate Program and Pastor of St. James in Falls Church. Author of That Nothing May Be Lost, Reflections on Catholic Doctrine and Devotion, and Sermons in Times of Crisis, 12 Homilies to Stir Your Soul. Father Scalia is a member of the Institute's Board of Advisors and has given numerous extremely popular lectures for us. We're pleased to welcome him back uh, to such, we're pleased to welcome back, I'm sorry about that, such a wonderful priest and friend. Please join me in welcoming Father Scalia. Thank you. I joked with some people on the way in that the first point of the examination of conscience was going to be gluttony, um, <laughs> seeing all of you finishing your dinners and getting into dessert. And, uh, and then I got here to the table and I, and I saw that at your dinner table was distributed for free a, a, a homily on fasting. <laughs> so uh, what I meant as a joke, I, I think, you know, the ICC did, did, did in reality here, so. Um, I want to uh, make a correction that uh, is also shameless uh, self-promotion. Uh, well, not self-promotion, but promotion of a book. And so um, I was mentioned that I that I author of that nothing may be lost, which is true. Uh, another book that's published last year is um, uh, Sermons in Times of Crisis: uh, 12, 12 Homilies to Stir Your Soul. Um, I'm not the author. I, I'm, I'm the editor. I wrote the introduction. I give a brief introduction to each of the homilies or sermons. Uh, but um, so if you're disappointed, well, you know, you'll have to settle for, for such homilists as, you know, Augustine, Ambrose, Chrysostom, <laughs> Pope Benedict, John Paul II, guys like that. Um, it's uh, a series of 12 homilies uh, or sermons that were preached uh, throughout the church's history. And uh, uh, the, the criterion for selecting those was uh, that each one was given in a particular time of crisis uh, in the church. And, uh, and so they, they show, they display how uh, the authentic uh, preacher of the word of God brings the word of God to bear in a particular moment uh, and enables us to see that the word of God is not something confined to the past, but is living and effective today. And so uh, I recommend, recommend that book. And you also see, because the, the, the sermons can be kind of hard going, they're, they're pretty deep, uh, also see how... Uh, how long the homilies were in the ancient world <laughs> and how grateful you should be today. Uh, the title for this evening's talk uh, is Preparing Our Hearts, A Guided Examination of Conscience for Holy Confession. And uh, I'd like to divide it into three parts. And uh, the first will just be to, to talk about the examination of conscience in general. What's its purpose? And second, uh, its place in the Catholic life. And then third, get into the, ex the guided examination um, in, in particular. And, uh, and that is more of a reflection. Uh, so what's, first of all, the purpose of the examination of conscience uh, by which we, um, we examine our conscience to, to discern uh, where we have failed? And, but as you'll see as I go along, it's not, that's not the only reason. The examination of conscience is not just for knowledge. We don't just examine ourselves, what we've done, what we've thought, said, or done, or failed to do. We don't examine ourselves in that way just for knowledge and that, gosh, isn't that interesting? I skipped mass last Sunday, you know. Uh, no, it, it is ordered towards contrition. The examination of conscience is ordered towards sorrow for our sins. Uh, and the importance of that can't be overstated. St. Thomas says that contrition contains virtually the whole of penance. That's a powerful line. 
that everything about, in particular, the sacrament of penance really is in seminal form in our contrition. And so I hope this, I, I want to impress on you the importance of cultivating contrition for your sins as much as you can, because the more you do, the more fruitful your confession. Contrition contains virtually the whole of penance. And so the examination of conscience is with a view to cultivating this contrition, making a good confession, and doing our penance. The confession and the penance are sort of contained already in seminal form in our contrition. And what is uh, our contrition? Now, the classic, of course, distinctions are uh, between imperfect and perfect contrition. I also like to tack on a third, uh, and uh, some of my parishioners have already heard me on this, but uh, uh, it's not gonna be the first time I repeat myself to them, so um, I'll continue. Uh, but uh, before we even get to the, the contrition, the Im to imperfect contrition, there's the contrition of pride. I can't believe that I did that. <laughs> I mean, those people, sure, <laughs> but I did it. Uh, and and that's, that, is, that doesn't even rise to the level of imperfect contrition. That, that's just a, pr a contrition that's, that's rooted in self-regard and self-centeredness and pride. Contrition is a sorrow for our sins. And it, it doesn't have to be this emotional thing. I mean, if the emotions follow along, so much the better. Uh, we see that in the Gospels. Peter weeps over his sins. Uh, Mary Magdalene you know, displays her, her sorrow quite dramatically. Uh, but even if we don't get there, even if it's just kind of this sober, very matter of fact acknowledgement that I have done wrong and I reject what I've done. I, I choose to be sorry for it. Our culture thinks that the emotions are always standalone things. No, our emotions desire to be governed by reason. And so the sorrow for sin, as I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, desires to be governed by reason. And, uh, and so our contrition is really, it's an act of the will. It's seeing what we've done wrong, acknowledging it, and choosing to be sorry for it, choosing to reject it. Imperfect contrition is when that, that decision is inspired by a fear of punishment. I'm heartily sorry for having offended thee because of thy just punishments or because of the loss of heaven and the pains of hell. Uh, that's a good motive. <laughs> when we say imperfect, we don't mean bad. We just mean it, there, there's more still to come. Um, to be sorry for our sins because God is just and punishes wrongdoing, that's good enough. And uh, that, in union with the sacrament, uh, br brings us uh, our, Lord's, our Lord's forgiveness. And then, of course, there is perfect contrition, and, and the uh, motive for that is love of God. I'm sorry for my sins, not just because I fear punishment, but as we say in the act of contrition, because they offend you, my God, who are all good and deserving of all my love. Choosing to be sorry for our sins, not just because I can't believe that I did it, not just because I'm going to get punished, but because God loves me perfectly, and I desire to love him more. As imperfect as I am, I desire to love him uh, in return as best I can. Now, the contrition that we have, the goal of it is to be united with Christ's contrition. And so keep in mind that in the sacrament of confession, uh, you are united with Christ in his sorrow for sin. This is an extraordinary thing. We know that we're united with Christ in the reception of Holy Communion. We fail to realize that the whole purpose of the sacraments of confession is to take our contrition and, and as, as one writer says, to graft God's grace upon it so that our contrition, as imperfect as it might be, is elevated and begins to participate in Christ's own sorrow for sin. And the more we cultivate it on our own, and the more we strive to, to be contrite for the right reasons and for the highest reasons, then the more efficacious uh, the, the sacrament is for us. Uh, the catechism says this uh, regarding imperfect contrition. Uh, 
says such a stirring of conscience can initiate an interior process which under the prompting of grace will be brought to completion by sacramental absolution and say and this is drawing on an observation that saint thomas makes he says that the minister of confession acts as the complement in, in other words he completes what the penitent is bringing the penitent is bringing that contrition and through the, 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 the ministry of the sacrament, through the ministry of the priest, that, that contrition is completed. Or as he says elsewhere, the sacrament is perfected by that which is done by the priest. And so again, this is a sacrament that depends greatly on our preparing ahead of time, our examining our conscience well, uh, asking the grace of the Holy Spirit to help us examine our conscience, choosing to be sorry for the highest reason, asking for assistance in doing that. And then th that's all before we even perhaps even go to the church, much less go into the confessional. Dom Marmion, uh, who is uh, one of the greatest writers, um, well, of the past, what, 100 years, uh, he puts it this way. Contrition, like the other acts of the penitent, takes on a sacramental character. Think of that, your contrition, as imperfect, as flawed as it might be, takes on a sacramental character. In this sacrament, the hatred of sin that Christ experienced in his agony and on the cross passes into our soul so as to produce there the destruction of sin. The downfall of sin effected by Christ, substituting himself for us in his passion, is reproduced in the penitent. The contrition remains what it is even outside the sacrament, an instrument of death to sin. But in the sacrament, the merits of Christ raise this instrument higher, infinitely, so to say, and give it a sovereign efficacy. This is a, a beautiful thing. You know, an, an analogy here is uh, for all of you married couples, um, the imperfect love that, that you brought to the altar on the day of your marriage. And I'm sorry, but it was imperfect, okay? Um, uh, uh, and probably still is, by the way. Um, uh, that was uh, made, that, that love you have for one another was sanctified. And, and it be, became, uh, by the grace of the sacrament, now becomes a, um, a means of grace for you. And so in this sacrament, he takes something that is flawed and imperfect, and he elevates it. Um, I know what you're thinking. It's even more so in holy orders, right? <laughs> Another writer says, um, says this, describes it this way. In the sacramental drama of penance, what takes place is nothing less than that the sinner joins the suffering Christ he enters into the mind and the work of the expiating savior. Here, a mystical union with the expiating Christ takes place in whose power the penitent even exercises and takes part in a certain redemptive function. Extraordinary what, what, the, what the sacrament effects. Our contrition is elevated and takes on an efficacy, a sovereign efficacy as Dom Marion puts it, but then also our penance is a participation in Christ's own sacrifice. You know, when you're assigned a penance uh, in, in confession, no penance you do can ever atone for any of your sins, ever. Uh, the whole purpose of penance, of your doing penance, is to unite you with Christ on the cross. And so that your, your acts of sacrifice uh, in atonement for sin take on uh, an efficacy, not on your own, but by way of the sacrament and because now they are united with Christ on the cross. But all of this, again, is in seminal form already um, in, our, in our contrition. And the examination of conscience has as its goal uh, producing the highest form of contrition uh, that, 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 we can, that we can find. And, and so it has this great importance, which brings me to the next section, second part. The place of the examination of conscience in the Catholic life. 
um, or sometimes it's simply called the examine. And if you look in the catechism uh, on, in the sacrament on penance, it doesn't just get just to the, to the sacrament. It talks about the various forms of penance in Catholic life. When we talk about penance, unfortunately, we, we confine it just to the sacrament. Uh, or if we broaden it from that, it's just in Lent. <laughs> but we're not letting it go anywhere. Okay, maybe Advent, but th that's it. All right. uh, but this should characterize the, the, the Catholic life uh, at all times. There should always be uh, the spirit of penance that we're trying to deepen within ourselves. The catechism calls it interior penance. The more uh, traditional uh, term for it was the virtue of penance, which I'll get to in a bit. Uh, and so the examination of conscience, or the examine, as it's sometimes called, uh, has an essential place in the Catholic life. If we are not observing it regularly, then we're actually not really living our faith as much as we should, or in the way that we should. So in this regard, there is, first of all, regularity. And so when we talk about the examination of conscience, this is something we do regularly. Uh, meaning daily. All of the great spiritual writers, even the mediocre ones, um, <laughs> will say, you know, a daily examination of conscience. Uh, and sometimes they'll say, you know, twice a day. So on a daily basis, examining how the last 24 hours have gone. This is a very important spiritual discipline. If you desire to have kind of a structured, regular uh, spiritual life and to make progress, this is essential. And if it's not there, you're really not going to make progress. In fact, you might regress. One way of understanding uh, the examination of conscience, well, there's, um, it, it, it's kind of a classic uh, analogy, is to a, a merchant uh, at the end of the day. You know, what is he doing? He's looking at the ledger. And he's, he's going over everything. And he's, and he's adding things up. And he's, he's making sure the books are, are all in order. And if he doesn't do that every day, um, he's not a very good merchant, and he probably won't be a merchant much longer, right? Um, now, if people who are invested in money are doing that on a regular basis and are assiduous about it, how much more so should we be attentive to taking account of what's going on uh, in our souls? And and examining our conscience on a regular basis. Another classic way of describing the examination of conscience is uh, actually to distinguish what um, the tradition calls the general examine and the particular. And so the general examine uh, is, well, it is just that. Since my last examination of conscience, going over the day, and the last 24 hours, and where have I failed? In thought, in word, in action, and, and in omission. And, and kind of taking stock of it, uh, giving, uh, well, in the, in the Jesuit tradition, uh, or Ignatian tradition, it, it would be 15 minutes. <laughs> that's, that's a long time, okay? And that's really kind of the, cent that, that's, that's central to Ignatian spirituality is really applying yourself very um, assiduously to a long examination of conscience. I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but for everyone, there should be that general examination of conscience. And, and you know, it's, what do we call it today? We kind of, I mean, this is, I think, part, although I've never actually researched what mindfulness is, I think this is kind of part of what people mean. You know, reflecting on your day and being mindful of, well, how did that conversation go? Yeah, maybe I was a little short with that person. Um, maybe I was, I was, you know, a little aggressive in traffic. But more likely, the other people are going too slow. Um, uh, and, uh, um, but going through the day, say, okay, where was I? Who did I interact with? And, 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 you know, what happened in that situation that maybe through the course of the day, I lost track of? Uh, but now when I reflect on it, I see, yeah, I, I could have done better there. Um, uh, during the course of the day, we get so busy and there's so many distractions, so many stimuli to distract us 
and, and to break our recollection that we can lose sight of what, um, uh, of what we've done. And so the general examination of conscience, uh, it, that, that, you know, um, that's the first. And sometimes it's, it's described as a shield. It's, it's a good, good image. So the general examination is a shield, you know, keeping us from, keeping things from hitting us. And then there's a particular examination of conscience. And this is described as a sword. So you, you, get, you get the picture with the shield, you're, you're, you're defending yourself. And actually a shield in the ancient world especially was, was used not just to keep things from hitting the person, but, but to, to push back. And the sword, of course, is to go on the attack. And so what is the particular exam? Uh, I remember uh, years ago meeting with a spiritual director and he said, he said Paul, what, what's your dominant defect? And I went, what? I mean, <laughs> the, presu you know, the presumption was, I know you've got a lot. What's just, just the dominant one, okay? <laughs> just the dominant one. Um, but that's, you know, that, that, this is, we, we all know this, right? Because when you go to confession, what do you feel like saying? Same as last time, Father, right? <laughs> because we all have a dominant defect. We all have a weakness that, that, um, uh, that leads us into sin again and again. And it's usually, by the way, that weakness is usually connected also to our strength. It's usually just the, you know, the flip side of our strength. Um, and so the particular examine uh, identifies, okay, what do I need to work on? Uh, what, what vice do I need to attack and go after? And what virtue do I need to cultivate? And making that a particular focus uh, of an examine daily. Um, and making that a particular focus in confession. So I'm trying to work on this in particular. Uh, you know, and I th I, we, we like these things because they kind of give structure, right? And this is why people like Lent. <laughs> because, okay, good. I've got, you know, 40 days I can do an entire lifetime. I don't know. But, uh, but 40 days. Um, and, and so, and usually, what do people do at the beginning of Lent? They identify a dominant defect. And then they identify a sacrifice that they have to make uh, in order to fight against it. Uh, so, you know, we're doing this already. We just didn't know the terms. So the particular examine, something to, um, to look at daily, a, a specific thing to, uh, to fight against and also a specific, specific virtue to cultivate. And in making the examination of conscience, of course, um, which, well, how do we go about it? Obviously, there needs to be quiet, need to be you know, time set aside. Uh, I mentioned before the Ignatian uh, examine is, that's central to Ignatian spirituality, so it's, it's much longer. Uh, but giving three, four, five minutes uh, is, is important. Um, and really trying to go deeper into uh, reflecting on uh, how we've done. But that's not the first step. I want to emphasize, and this is, this is, um, this is according to Ignatius's structure of the examine. Uh, first, give thanks. First, give thanks. Because the greater reality in your life is not your sinfulness. It's God's goodness. If we examine our conscience and try to discern our sins without an understanding of God's goodness, without first giving thanks to him for all the good he's given us, um, it, it, it ends up being a little sadistic, right? <laughs> that that we, we are just kind of looking at the negative and it's out of context. Our sins are a failure to respond to God's goodness. Our sins are a lack. They're an absence of good. And so making ourselves aware, first of all, of the good that God has given us, that, that sets the proper context for a consideration of our sins. Because if we consider ourselves as sinners without an understanding of God as good, that, that's, that's recipe for, for uh, despondency, if not despair. So I encourage you, when you place yourself in the presence of God, remind yourself of God's presence, 
uh, the next step should be to go over the past 24 hours, however long since your last examine, and consider uh, all of the gifts that God has given you. Uh, and I guarantee you that that will also make clear to you where you failed. Because again, our sins are typically a failure to respond to God's goodness. I mentioned before the virtue of penance. Uh, and this really, I think, emphasizes the place of the examination of conscience in Catholic life. The current catechism refers to it as interior penance. Uh, the Catechism of Trent and uh, St. Thomas pr uh, prior to that refer to it as the virtue of penance. Uh, what does a virtue do? Every virtue is meant to put order into the emotions. Wouldn't that be lovely, right? <laughs> Uh, because we know that very often what leads us into sin is disordered emotions. Anger, lust, gluttony, right? <laughs> uh, the virtues are help to, to restrain the emotions so that they are at our service and that we're not enslaved to them. The emotions are good servants, bad masters. The virtues make them our servants. The virtue of penance, St. Thomas says, um, gives us a moderated grief for past sins. Now, when it says moderated, um, in, in our ears, it means like, yeah, 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 don't make too big a deal of it. But what Thomas means like is, is that, no, it is in the proper mode. It, it is in, in the proper place. And if your past sins are really serious, you should feel a very serious grief. Uh, and if your sins are not as serious, well, then you should feel the corresponding grief. Uh, in the confessional, uh, you know, one role of the priest is to help cultivate this virtue of penance so that you have the proper sorrow for your sins, so that you're not faulting yourself uh, too severely, but at the same time, you're, you're not letting yourself off the hook. Um, and, and people do both things. Uh, a moderated grief for past sins, St. Thomas says, and then another uh, dimension, as he puts it, is with the intention of removing them. And here, uh, with the examination of conscience, ordered towards contrition, an essential part of contrition is the intention not to commit the sin again. The intention, the act of the will the choice, the deliberate choice, I will not to commit this sin again. So why do I? <laughs> and again and again. Well, okay, because of human weakness. Okay. Uh, a lot of people get discouraged and say, well, gosh, you know, I, how serious can I be if I keep falling back into it? Well, maybe there does need to be some changes made so that, so that you are more serious about your contrition and about your confession. But at the same time, it is human weakness that, that inclines us to, to our, you know, our particular sins, our dominant defects. Um, when we talk about what St. Thomas says, the intention of removing them, um, we mean that, that deliberate choice not to sin again, but then, as his phrase um, indicates, we want to remove this, in, this particular inclination to sin. We don't just want to be sorry for it, we don't want it just, the guilt to be removed. We don't want just the effects to be removed. We, we actually want it to be taken out of our souls. Uh, and the virtue of penance uh, is what kind of strengthens us to desire these things and seek them and act on them. And like any virtue, it, it, it's meant to be habitual. Okay? If you very occasionally uh, do something courageous, that doesn't make you a courageous person. <laughs> um, uh, and in order for a virtue to be true, to be real, it needs to be habitual. A virtue is something that is, in, it's, is a habitual disposition in the soul. And so the virtue of penance is this habitual capacity to examine our conscience to, and to be sorry for our sins in the proper manner, uh, to, to hate them um, according, accordingly as they should be hated. Um, and to do that as something uh, habitual, something uh, that is in our lives, not just every now and then, 
not just you know during Lent and Advent uh, or when we really, really, really need to go to confession, um, but every day. And the virtue of penance also, as this indicates, should be integrated in the rest uh, of our devotional life. Uh, and so from confession to confession, uh, you know, every communion we receive should be more efficacious than the last. Isn't that horrifying? <laughs> but uh, that's what all the, you know, uh, um, Gary Gould Lagrange, great, great Thomistic, I, um, the great Thomist, I remember reading that going, oh my gosh, you know, but that's true. Uh, the communion received today uh, should already dispose you to receive your next communion uh, more devoutly. I think the same, the same thing is true with confession, always trying to make a better confession than the last. Um, in this regard, you know, the church uh, has these wonderful prayers. Uh, uh, there's a prayer, there, there's a, a mass that can be said for the forgiveness of sins. Um, and, uh, I just want to read some of the prayers. And it's drawn, most of it's drawn straight from the 1962 Missal. So this is a deep tradition in the church. So the collect, or the opening prayer, as it's sometimes called, mistakenly, um, is um, Almighty and most gentle God, who brought forth from the rock a fountain of living water for your thirsty people, bring forth, we pray, from the hardness of our heart, tears of sorrow, that we may lament our sins and merit forgiveness from your mercy. It's such a wonderful prayer. It's great. He, Lord, you could get water out of the rock. You know, surely you can get something out of me too, right? You can, you can get some sorrow, some, some contrition out of me. And then the prayer uh, over the gifts. Um, Look mercifully, O Lord, upon this oblation, which we offer to your majesty for our sins, and grant, we pray, that the sacrifice from which forgiveness springs forth for the human race May, may bestow on us the grace of the Holy Spirit to shed tears for our offenses. Now, what you're doubtless noticing is that, is that these prayers give an emphasis to being sorry for our sins um, and increasing that sorrow. Because although some people are too severe themselves, that's probably not the dominant defect of our culture, is it? <laughs> um, I, I think, that, you know, typically what we need is, is, uh, is a deeper sorrow. Uh, for our sins. And, you know, and, and, and another thing about, about a virtue is that once the virtue is in, you know, sort of in the right spot, there can never be too much of it, right? You can't have too much faith. And I'm, whoa, that's, that's enough. <laughs> um, you, can, you, can, you can never have too much charity and the virtue of penance. We can never be too sorry for our sins. We can be sorry in the wrong way, but we can, once we, we hit that proper sorrow, uh, it, it can go deeper and deeper. And the deeper it goes, uh, then the deeper also is the joy of forgiveness. Uh, and I'll, I'll take one, one of these prayers from the 1962 Missal. Um, <laughs> o Lord God, in thy mercy, look down on the offering which we make to thy divine majesty for our sins and draw from our eyes such floods of tears as may quench the burning flames which we deserve. Okay, there it is. It's other people, not us, okay? <laughs> that said, I want to turn now to, uh, to the third part, uh, which is more of a reflection and, um, and is really sort of the guided uh, examination. There are different uh, ways of examining the conscience, uh, different templates that people can use. Ten Commandments, obviously. Um, most examinations of conscience are, are shaped around the Ten Commandments. Uh, or the seven deadly sins, or the capital vices, whatever you want to call them. Um, or uh, around the virtues, how have I failed to live these virtues? Or uh, the threefold command, or the twofold commandment of love, which is really three, right? How have I failed to love God, to love myself, to love neighbor? Um, this evening, I want to take today's gospel as, as the guide uh, for our, our examination, uh, not only because it's timely, and, um, but, but also because uh, it does help us to situate um, our, our sins within and, and make them more personal to our Lord. Because the horror of sin is not that it's a transgression of a law, but that it, that it, it afflicts our Lord's sacred heart. That is the horror of sin. 
And so situating this exam in, um, in light of our Lord's suffering uh, and his temptations uh, will help us to see them as more connected to him uh, and prompt uh, a deeper uh, and more precise sorrow for our sins. Um, the temptations that the evil one brings against our Lord in the desert, um, the classic way of understanding them, of course, is, is that to, to put ourselves in, in our Lord's place, right? And just as he was tempted in these ways, we are tempted in that way too. But Pope Benedict brings out another way of understanding it in a complementary way, which is not as flattering. It sees us in the place of the devil. And these are the ways that we tempt God. And these are the things that we demand of God. And actually, these th two things are related because the more that we give in to one of these temptations, if we put ourselves in Christ's place, the more that we give in to one of the devil's temptations, the more we inevitably agree with him and sort of like take his side and then demand something of God. So we can understand these not only in terms of how we are tempted, but how we tempt God. Another reason I want to um, use, use this structure is because uh, they're centered on our divine filiation, meaning our, our status as children of God. That is everything. That is everything. Uh, to live as a child of God is, is, is glorious. And if we have that identity, not notionally, but in the marrow of our bones, then we can resist temptation and we will live uh, a, a holy life. And the devil's temptation is to, his tactic is to draw our Lord away from that, to, to put a wedge between Christ and his father. And he's already, he knows how this is done because he did it with Adam. That, that's the first sin. Adam doubts God the Father. Adam wants to kind of construct his own sonship, uh, design it himself. And so the devil comes back to the new Adam, to our Lord, and he tries the same thing. How does he introduce the, the, the temptations? If you are the son of God, and so now he's, he's kind of, you know, well, what does that mean? And he's kind of trying to drop a little seed of doubt into our Lord's soul, trying to, to get our Lord away from his father. The devil's intention is not so much to discern whether Christ is the son of God. It's to tempt him away from trusting in the father's plan. Christ, the eternal son of God, the only begotten son of the father, has come into the world to offer his life for us to offer his life on the cross. And since that is the father's plan, now the devil wants to take him away from that plan, take him away from the father. And so each temptation is ultimately a temptation away from sonship. And every temptation that we encounter in our lives is a temptation away from our status as children of God. And what we do is we, we we prefer something to, to that status. We prefer something else to being children of God. And so to look at these one by one. If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. The father wills that our Lord sacrifice his body, that he make that sacrifice of his body on the cross. The devil offers instead a counterfeit sonship. The devil offers the satisfaction of physical appetites to seek that satisfaction in place of the father's will. And so for us, each of us needs to ask, how have I allowed my desire for physical satisfaction, gratification and comfort to lead me away from my father. And it's in this context that we can consider gluttony, eating too much, or eating poorly, not as 
children of God, but in our culture, eating sort of in an animalistic way, uh, not making eating something that is social and interactive, but making it just something that I will do as I drive through McDonald's or wherever else, eating poorly, or a lack of mortification at the table. St. Jose Maria says, once you have eaten without any sort of mortification or self-denial at the table, then you've, eaten, you've become a barbarian. Or gratifying the body by abuse of alcohol. Drinking too much, perhaps not to the point of drunkenness, although obviously that is gravely wrong, but Drinking simply to take the edge off. Just a drink here or there in the evening uh, to take the edge off, uh, which makes us less present to others. When was the last time I fasted uh, when I didn't have to? When was the last time I abstained from meat when I didn't have to or abstained from alcohol? How have allowed my desire for physical satisfaction, gratification, and comfort to lead me away from my father? Lust is another way in which we fail in this, allowing the sexual appetite to dictate and to draw us away from our father. Sexually impure thoughts, words, actions. Not turning our eyes away from the soft pornography that characterizes our culture. Sloth. Sloth is not simply laziness. It's not just a physical laziness, but it is, a, it is a spiritual sadness. And it's a spiritual sadness that is connected to, well, not wanting to sacrifice, not wanting to submit the body to the spiritual good of following our Lord. And sloth takes the form of a certain entitlement mentality. I've had a long day. It's been tough. I deserve to binge watch whatever silly show. Uh, this is my time. Sloth is at the root of most use of pornography in our culture. It is not a, a man living a vibrant life who seeks out pornography, but one who's afflicted by sloth who wants to indulge rather than strive. Skipping mass comes from this because the man dominated by sloth does not want to rest in the Lord. He does not want the rest that characterizes the children of God. He wants a different kind of rest. He wants his own kind. And so if he's skipping mass, omitting prayers, not doing my morning offering, not doing my examination, not saying my rosary, avoiding confession, working on Sunday unnecessarily. The man of sloth will use work to keep God at arm's length. I didn't pray because I was too busy. Rather, made myself too busy precisely so that I wouldn't be able to pray. How have I allowed my desire for physical satisfaction, gratification, and comfort to lead me away from my father? The second temptation. The devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will give you his angels, he will give his angels charge of you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. The Father wills that our Lord give his life uh, in obscurity and in humiliation. That the road to our redemption is one of humiliation and rejection. The devil proposes a different path. 
as Fulton Sheen uh, explains, this is sort of work a prodigy, work an extraordinary miracle, and then everyone will like you and will believe and follow. In other words, place the esteem of men ahead of God. So for us, how have I allowed the desire for acceptance, approval, and praise to lead me away from my father? That is what the devil desires to do to us. If you are children of God, he in effect says, you shouldn't have to suffer these things. You should be liked. And what sins do what sins crop up from this are vanity, wanting to be noticed, wanting to be commended, to be praised, wanting credit. All the while our heavenly father is looking down on us in love. He is attentive to us at every moment and desiring our attention in return. And yet we are chasing after the esteem of others. Allowing what others think to determine our actions. Should I pray in the restaurant? Should I say grace? Should I speak of my faith? Should I participate in the gossip? If I don't, what will people think? It leads to human respect, withholding our witness because of what others will think. It leads to immodesty in speech and in and dress. Immodesty in speech, always talking about myself, self-referential thinking. And immodesty in dress, look at me. And vanity's rotten fruit is envy. Vanity is when we want all of the notice. We want all the attention. And when we don't get it, somebody else does, then we envy. A resentment at the success of others, or that others are praised, or commended, or noticed, and I'm neglected. And this can lead to gossiping about them. Well, because if I can take them down a peg or two, it makes me feel better about myself. It is the seeing of life as competition. That if somebody is doing well, that means somehow there's less for me. And it can lead to hatred, hatred for the other, because the other is in competition. And this envy, makes its way into marriages. And so instead of husband and wife being complementary, they become competitive. Each one keeping a little scorecard of how things are going. How have I allowed the desire for acceptance, approval, and praise to lead me away from my father? The third temptation. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said to him, all these, I will give, all these, I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. It is a temptation to power. It's the father's will that our Lord become a king by way of the cross. It is because he gave his life on the cross that he is now king. The devil proposes a counterfeit sonship, a different way. Instead of that sacrificial gift of of himself in order to obtain the kingship, no, just cut corners and the kingdoms will be entrusted to him. It's a sonship of earthly power, of control. How have I allowed that desire for control 
to lead me away from my father. It all comes down to this. Either he is in control and we are joyfully participating in his will or we are asserting our control. In our culture, we have the term control freak. We are all control freaks spiritually. We all want to elbow him out of the way and seize control. And what does this lead to? Anger, when we are not in control, when we don't get our way, when people are not abiding by our schedule, when other drivers aren't doing what we think they ought to be doing. It leads to harsh words so that I can assert my will over the other. It can lead to harsh actions. It leads to rash judgment. Because if I can judge that person, now I, in my own mind anyway, I have some control. It leads to simple discourtesy and rudeness because control of my life takes precedence over everything else. And it leads to avarice or greed because money and possessions, we think, will give us more control over things, which is why we chase after them. But of course, the opposite is true. The more we have, uh, the, the, the less satisfied we are because now we have more things that we have to control. And they start to control us instead. Leads to a lack of generosity because again, to be means to be in competition in this mindset. And if I'm generous to someone, then there might not be enough for me to control things. Cheating my employer by not working diligently, cutting corners on tasks, spending irresponsibly. How have I allowed that desire for control to lead me away from my father? What is the path out of this? Our Lord responds to the devil, not by exerting his omnipotence, not by outwitting him. He triumphs as a trusting son of the father. Each response he gives is simply a quote from scripture. And he simply has absolute trust in his heavenly father. He doesn't have to push back against the evil one. He doesn't have to outwit him. He simply needs to go deeper into his identity as the child of God. And we, in resisting temptation, we make the mistake of thinking that if I push back on the devil, then I'll triumph. Or maybe I can outwit him. No, the path out of temptation and out of sin is to go deeper into our identity as children of God. And part of being children of God means for us who are not by nature his children, but by adoption, by his grace, is to clear out more room for his grace to be effective by the virtue of penance, by the examination of conscience, by cultivating that contrition. And so as we conclude this reflection, allow me to uh, just impart a blessing over you. It's the blessing that is given at the end of Mass on Ash Wednesday and sets the tone for the entirety of Lent. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Pour out a spirit of compunction, O God, on those who bow before your majesty, and by your mercy, May they merit the rewards you promise to those who do penance. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 One peace. Thank you, Father. Do you have any suggestions on how to balance zeal with scrupulos scrupulosity? Okay, yeah, um, well, that, that actually touches on something that I mentioned earlier, which is how our, our strengths um, can become our weaknesses, right? And um, 
So uh, I would say the, the sort of the flip side of zeal, the way it becomes our weakness is, is not by way of scrupulosity as much as it is uh, zeal can lead to people being judgmental or harsh. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so, and this is what, you know, the, the devil, he manipulates our weaknesses. We know that he also manipulates our strengths. And so he'll, he'll encourage zeal uh, to the point where, you know, it, it becomes, you know, you're, you're running roughshod over people. Uh, as a friend of mine said, he, says, he, he said, uh, it was like I had beaten someone over the head with a monstrance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Descriptive. Okay. Okay. And, and so, um, yeah, that's um, scrupulosity. Now, uh, there is, a, I think, there's a scrupulosity, which is just, you, you know, you're being too sensitive about things or you're, you're but the, there's also scrupulosity that, that can be, that, that is more psychological. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about just this, the zeal that, that can, you know, okay, now you're, you're applying it too much, okay? And so, um, yeah, that can, that, that can be a danger. One way in which our strength be, can become a weakness um, someone asked me at the break, and see the veterans of ICC know that if you can get to the speaker before the Q and A, you can get your question in ahead of time. Okay, uh, and and so um, how do our weaknesses become our strengths? Okay, well, well they don't, <laughs> but our weaknesses become an occasion for us to lean more on Christ and to rely on His grace more. Second Corinthians twelve. St. Paul says, to keep me from being too elated by, by the abundance of revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I begged the Lord about this, that it should leave me. And there's been tons of ink spilled on what exactly was this that St. Paul was talking about. What was this thorn in the flesh? But it was, it was some, perhaps some habitual vice, some weakness that he had that, that was loathsome to him. Okay. Um, Try to imagine such a situation, right? If you can, right? <laughs> Having a habitual vice that you don't want, right? Um, three times I begged the Lord about this, that it should leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So we don't want to say that our weaknesses become good or become strengths. They remain weaknesses. They remain defects, but we can use them as an occasion to rely on the grace of God more. Or St. Paul says here that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when, am I, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Introducing that veteran rule, Father Scalia, you're not going to be able to leave the... Uh building after we end Q&A because the second veteran rule is if you storm the speaker after Q&A, but we won't go there. Um, Mark is writing in online and he's asking if you could clarify uh, the, the sort of purpose of a general confession. He's wondering, you know, I've confessed this sin. It has been forgiven in the past. So could you uh, maybe put another coat of paint on why, what's the purpose of bringing it up again in a general confession? Good, yeah, a general confession is, um, you know, it's, it's a traditional practice done, you know, uh, per, before, um, Maria von Trapp did it before she got married, you know, and uh, that, that's what, what a great devotional thing. I, I want to, to go back and what's the purpose of it? Uh, the purpose is to deepen our sorrow. Uh, as we mature in the spiritual life, we begin to see our past sins more clearly. And if we're not seeing them more clearly, we're not maturing in the spiritual life. When, you know, the sins of our youth, when we first confess them, it was, it may have been one of the, uh, what I call the make it go away confession. <laughs> you, know, you know, there I confessed it, it's gone. Okay, now I can get on with the rest of my life. And then, you know, years later, uh, as, as a person matures in the spiritual life, the, those sins are seen more clearly because they, 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 under, you know, they know more about life now and, and what they may have attributed to as a youthful indiscretion years ago. Now they see, no, I was actually much worse than that. Now, it doesn't make them guilty all over again, 
but it does mean it, and, and this is a good thing, it, they, they want to express that deeper contrition uh, for, for the sin. Uh, and so it, it's a good practice in, in that way. And, uh, and, it's, and it's, again, bringing, bringing those sins. Uh, and usually it's done within the context of, you know, please don't do this Saturday afternoons, okay? Okay. Don't, don't do this on Good Friday when there are 40 other people in line. Um, but usually, you know, it's arranged with the priest and, um, and it would, it's, you know, included in it as, you know, whatever other sins have, have been committed since the last confession. So, uh, but that's, that's the, uh, the tradition and the practice of a general confession. It can be a very, um, a very beneficial thing. Um, and it, again, usually done when people are entering into a new vocation or, you know, undergoing a deeper conversion. Thank you, Father. Hello, Father. Oh, is it on? Um, and as I traveled around the world and seen different priests everywhere around the world, sometimes I run into um, the thought that life circumstances can mitigate sinful behavior or, or mitigate the sin. Uh, can you speak a, a little bit about that? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the quality of a moral act, or the, the, the morality of an act is determined uh, by, by the intentions, the object, and the circumstances. Okay. So circumstances do have bearing on uh, the, um, on our culpability. Okay. Um, there are certain things that are always and at all times wrong. No circumstances can ever make them right. But some circumstances might make the person less culpable for committing them. Okay. It is always and at all times wrong uh, to lie. Okay. How do you like my dress? Okay. <laughs> the wife asks her husband. Okay. Okay. Well, those, okay. That's, those are circumstances that reduce his culpability. Um, um, no, the, you know, the classic thing that the Nazis, the Nazis at the door, whatever else. Okay. And so if, if lying is wrong and it is, it, it, you know, are, are you going to be condemned for lying in a dire situation like that? No, you know, probably not uh, a better, less controversial, um, I guess, more direct, if, uh, uh, would not less controversial, but I think clearer, uh, abortion is always at all, all times wrong. But a woman who is pressured into having an abortion, which is many of them, um, that reduces her culpability um, a tremendous amount, if not completely. Okay. And, you know, the, the church recognizes this in her laws because abortion is an excommunicable offense. Whoever participates in procuring a direct abortion is by that very act excommunicated, provided that the person knows that that penalty is attached to it and the person is doing that freely, okay? And so this helps us to understand how circumstances can reduce culpability, okay? Circumstances might also change uh, the nature of a sin. Well, to, so for ex the classic example is a starving man taking a loaf of bread. That it's, is that stealing? The traditional answer is no. He's a starving man. And uh, the goods of the world are meant to benefit everyone. Uh, private property is the way that we are to extend this to everyone. But if a man is starving uh, and he steals a loaf of bread, it's not, it's not technically not stealing. It's been the classic um, explanation. And this is why an examination of conscience is so important. And, uh, you know, explaining these things in the confessional. Okay. And this is why confession is so important. Because you, you have an external auditor there helping you to, you know, look at your books. Look at the ledger. And, uh, you know, he might look at it and say, yeah, you got everything right. And he might look at it and say, whoa, <laughs> you're, you're reading this all wrong. Um, you know, Father, I, I, skipped, I, I skipped Mass on Sunday. Well, why did you skip Mass? Well, Father, there was snow, and I'm, there's three feet of snow, and I'm 80 years old and um, confined to a wheelchair. And, uh, okay, okay. Okay, that, that's when it's helpful to have somebody say, okay, you know what, that's probably, pro pro probably not a sin. Okay. So, okay. Thank you, Father. There's uh, one last question coming in. It's kind of a combination. Multiple people are writing in. They sort of started this practice of trying to go to confession more regularly, but they've hit this place where either uh, they are like just coming up with 
what seems to be small things, trivial things, and they feel a little bit silly uh, repeating those, or um, they're trying to um, think of sins and they're sort of drawing a blank, but they know it's silly, they know they've sinned, uh, they're not really sure what to do. If you could give some advice. Okay. <laughs> um, well, uh, refer to something I said at uh, the beginning of the talk. I mean, the one who really is helping us to examine our conscience is the Holy Spirit. And, and, so, um, and so, so first, always asking uh, the Holy Spirit, please enlighten my mind so that I see things clearly. And also, I think part of that prayer should be, I want to see things clearly. <laughs> I'm already sorry for my sins. I don't even know what they are yet, okay? But, but I want to know what they are so, so that I can have that proper sorrow. Um, and, uh, and then again, something I, I mentioned earlier, uh, reflecting on things in light of God's goodness. And so thinking, okay, what are all the good things that God has given me today? Um, and from the, the most obvious to, to the, the most obscure. And how did I respond to those? I think that would be a good way of, of um, a sort of making the confession more and more precise. Um, and uh, yeah, I go, go with those two, th those two things. And, and don't get discouraged when you know, you're going to regular confession, it's the same thing, same thing. Thank God you're not doing you know, new things. Right? I mean, what? You know, hey, great news, Father. I got something new. Um, so, um, uh, I, I mentioned earlier uh, the author um, or the, the spiritual writer, Dom Marmion, um, Columba Mar Marmion. He's, I think he's blessed now. Um, no, is he saint? No, he's blessed. I don't know. Anyway, you should read him, no matter what he is. Um, and uh, M-A-R-M-I-O-N, uh, his classic, classic work is Christ, the Life of the Soul. Uh, and that's where I drew some of my quotes. Somebody, somebody had asked me uh, about that as well. Okay. Thank you so much, Father. All right.